gosh, it's very bright up here. And um, thank you all for being here this morning. And thank you for that lovely introduction. And no, I'm not world famous, um, but <laughs> I'm really grateful to be have been invited uh, to be a part of this event. And first, I'd like to make sure, can everybody hear me? OK. And it is extremely bright up here, I'm just going to say that. Um, I just thought, in addition to that lovely introduction, I'd start off by saying just a little bit about more about my work. As Stephen said, I'm an independent freelance journalist and writer. I specialize in writing about science and the environment. And the focus of my work has largely been what I think of as environmental health. And I define that to mean health of the environment, health of the natural world, public health, meaning how the environment affects all aspects of human health. And within that, I also include occupational health, how the workplace environment, whatever that might be, affects the health of the people who work there. And I think about all of those things as being inextricably linked. You can't really separate one from the other. And one of the things that I've learned um, in the work that I've done writing articles and books is that it's become absolutely abundantly clear that our environment, indoors and out, now is recognized to play a really important role in every complex disease, and that our exposure to environmental hazards, whatever they may be, whatever their sources, can profoundly affect our health. And as a result, a lot of what I've ended up writing about recently are the health effects of chemicals. And I think I might maybe stop right here and try to define a little bit for people how I think about chemicals. Because you hear the word chemical and it be, can be kind of scary. And in fact, as the previous two speakers just alluded to, everything on Earth is made up of chemicals. And just because something is described as a chemical doesn't mean it's bad, doesn't mean it's good. But the kind of chemicals that I've spent a lot of time reading about and now writing about are what I think of as synthetic industrial chemicals. For the most part, chemicals that don't occur naturally on Earth. They were made in a laboratory for a specific purpose to be used in a product or a manufacturing process. And those are the kind of chemicals that I've spent most of the time thinking about. And I've ended up writing about the health effects of these chemicals in all sorts of different contexts largely in the context of consumer products that can be as different as cosmetics and personal care products and clothing, electronics, building materials, but also when these kinds of chemicals get out into the environment and start affecting people's health in the wake of environmental disasters and through toxic waste sites. At the same time, this work researching the health effects of chemicals has also introduced me to a couple of fields that are also really closely tied. Green chemistry, as it's called, and also something called design for the environment, both of which are focused on both making new materials and designing products that are safe for human health and the environment throughout the entire life of those products. And I want you just to keep that in mind as I go about describing various environmental health problems, because I think it's important to understand how so many chemicals that we're using today, that we're surrounded by today, are affecting our health and why understanding how they behave presents challenges for solving these problems. And that's where things like green chemistry, design for the environment, learning how to make safe products, I think is a really important part of the solution and to solving these environmental health problems that we're now confronting. So what I thought I'd share with you this morning is some of what scientists have been learning about how environmental chemical exposure can affect human health and also where some of the solutions may be found. And I was going to use this quote a little bit later on in the talk, but I thought maybe I would try to move it up to the front so that you could kind of keep it in mind as I'm describing problems. And he's probably not the only person who said something like this, but a scientist named Paul Anastas, who with John Warner is considered one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, has said that the reason to understand a problem is to empower its solution. 
And that's something I believe really firmly. I'm not sure I could do my work as a journalist writing about all sorts of environmental problems if I didn't think about that a lot. But I, I really think that's true. And um, bear with it. Bear, bear that in mind as I go about describing what's going to be kind of a litany of discouraging problems. But I think if you don't understand the problems, it's really impossible to figure out where to go about solving them. So one of the things that's become abundantly clear in the past 10 to 20 years, though there were beginning to be really good understandings of it even before that, is that environmental chemical exposures are increasingly being linked to a whole host of what are now common, widespread chronic diseases and health disorders. And I'll just list them in no particular order. Diabetes, cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, obesity, developmental, reproductive, and neurological disorders, behavioral and learning problems, allergies, and increased risk for certain cancers. All of these are increasingly being linked to environmental chemical exposures. Doesn't necessarily mean that a specific exposure caused a particular disease, but they set the stage and increase the susceptibility and vulnerability and likelihood that more people may develop these conditions. And as we all know, those diseases are now, and health disorders are now kind of rampant and epidemic among just the world population. One of the other things that's become abundantly clear is that one of the times in life that is most crucial for these exposures in terms of how they may end up affecting human health is exposure at very early stages of life. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But in addition to those kind of chemical exposures that are now being linked in all sorts of scientific studies with animals and with human cells to specific disease outcomes, it's also become increasingly understood that environmental pollutants and stressors, things like pollution, air pollution from tailpipe emissions, vehicular pollution, also poor nutrition, domestic stress and community violence, those kind of environmental stressors can actually be contributors to physiological conditions that can increase an individual's vulnerability to both infectious diseases and the kind of effects that chemicals can cause. And in fact, there are quite a number of studies now, for example, with children who are exposed to both lead and also to traffic pollution or some kind of psychological stress that produces chemical responses within the body that can exacerbate how the chemicals then interact with cells. So we're learning more and more about how the environment can affect how cells and how the working of the human body behaves. One of, there are a few other things that I want to try to pinpoint, and if I would, was a slide maker, I would have kind of a timeline where there might be some pinpoints where there were sort of growing bunches of information that started to really change how we understand environmental health. Since the 1950s, if not earlier, probably much, much earlier, scientists and health professionals have truly been aware and known quite a lot about the potential adverse health impacts of lots of different chemicals that are used, particularly in industry and manufacturing. Things like pesticides and sort of hydrocarbon chemistry and things used in heavy industry. And even longer ago than that, for centuries, people have been aware about the toxic and hazardous effects of heavy metals, things like lead and mercury. So the idea that being exposed to a chemical environmentally could make you sick, that's not new. But historically, what was focused on were severe, acute, immediate reactions, something that might immediately impact your ability to breathe, or something that might have a really dramatic impact on your nervous system, or you know, some kind of skin reaction. A little bit later on, people started focusing on really dramatic adverse health effects like birth defects or certain unusual cancers. These were all acute, rare, unusual, big effects. And those 
for a, to a large extent, are the types of health effects that our chemical regulatory system was designed to address. As one scientist I've talked to whose work is really interesting, and if you ever get a chance to hear Terry Collins from Carnegie Mellon speak, I really encourage you to do that. He's absolutely fascinating. And as he said to me once, and I'm sure he said this in his lectures, we've gotten good at stopping, from, stopping people from dropping dead on the factory floor. And yeah, we actually have, that doesn't happen so much anymore, thank goodness. We've also done a pretty good job, or a lot better job than we did back in the 1960s and 70s before our big environmental laws like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act were enacted at addressing really big industrial sources of pollution, things that come out of smokestacks and drain pipes and nasty toxic waste drums that get dumped somewhere. That's the kind of really big industrial pollution that people had been focused on 30, 40 years ago. What we've learned since then, particularly since the late 1980s, certainly throughout the 90s and the past 10 to 15 years, is that in addition to those big industrial sources, we are now surrounded with chemicals that are in finished products and that those chemicals are actually emerging from those finished products while they're being used as they're intended to. So you don't have to wait until the thing is broken or it's discarded or it's in a dump to have chemicals leaching out of plastics, out of textiles that have things in their coatings or that have been put into upholstery foam. These chemicals are coming out and ending up in indoor air, in household dust, and if you could picture a really big change in the landscape of how we understand sources of chemicals. In the 1960s and 70s and earlier, the focus was, if you draw a map, sort of a smokestack here, a drain pipe here, and yes, the stuff was getting into the environment and affecting people in the immediate vicinity, and eventually it would move out. But now we're also dealing with all these little tiny sources that are with us all the time literally these days since before birth. And this radically changes how you need to start thinking about the solutions. Because you can think about reducing the smokestack emissions. You can put a scrubber on them. Ideally, you don't send the toxics out of the smokestack at all, but there are ways you can try and sort of put something on the end of the pipe, so to speak. But when it comes to a uh, piece of upholstery or a piece of plastic that's in an electronic appliance or your child's baby bottle or your drinking cup, you can't put a scrubber on that. You can't somehow put something on the end of that pipe. You just have to think about that entirely differently. And that's where the green chemistry design for the environment comes in. So big change in thinking about sources. Another thing to keep in mind, and I think Dr. Clement um, alluded to this, is that one of the things we also have to deal with is the fact that a lot of the chemicals that are being used in products and manufacturing processes are designed to last a really long time. They're what's called persistent. They don't break down easily in the environment. And some of them can last literally for decades. Um, Things like PCBs that I'm sure some of you have heard of, they haven't been used commercially since the 1970s, but they're still being found everywhere. They were used for in, as insulating fluids and electronics. And they're just these really persistent molecules. Same thing for pesticides like DDT. And it turns out there are lots of other things that have been widely used, like the flame retardants I'm sure many of you have read about that are used in upholstery foam and plastics. They have molecules that are designed to last. Same thing with the waterproofing compounds and the stain-resistant compounds, the things that make non-stick pans and things like that, designed to last a really long time. So there are any number of these chemicals that once they get into household dust, they get into the adjacent air, they can end up going down a drain. They move around the world. You can't see them. Dr. Clement, these, and, and um, Stephen Shore said, these, these are these invisible things, but they're moving around all the time. And so now scientists are finding some of these chemicals halfway around the world from where they were ever used. And I started reading these studies and was just absolutely perplexed and fascinated as to how 
chemicals that are used to make frying pans resist sticky food or to make a couch cushion not burst into flame, they're ending up in polar bears. They're ending up in sea turtles. They're ending up in seals. I mean, why, why are these things moving around the world? So you've got some of these things that last a really long time. There are other chemicals, some of the things that you also may have heard of, like bisphenol A that makes up polycarbonate plastic that has gotten more than its um, fair share of press recently, and chemicals that are called, there's a whole class of chemicals with a funny name called phthalates, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. And they have lots and lots of uses, one of which is to make polyvinyl chloride, PVC plastic flexible. Without them, it would be kind of brittle. They also are used um, to make synthetic fragrances last longer. They're in personal care products. They're just used in a lot of things. And those kind of chemicals, things like BPA, they don't last a long time in the environment. In fact, they break down pretty quickly. But they're so widely used that scientists consider them our, our exposure to them virtually continuous or continual and the, that the exposure is ubiquitous. So we have this combination we're surrounded with now that there are chemicals that last a long time, there are some that don't last so long, but we're continually being exposed to them because, frankly, they're kind of in everything. They're really hard to avoid. So we have all these different sources. We have things that last a long time. We have things that are just everywhere. and. Another one of the huge things that's changed is how we understand where these chemicals are ending up and how they're interacting with living cells. And just a couple other things I want to remember to say about the numbers of these chemicals. And this can all be kind of overwhelming, and I don't want anybody to you know, just feel I have to duck under their seats. But there are tens of thousands of these chemicals that are used, a number that gets thrown out in the United States about the number of chemicals registered for com in commerce is more than 80,000. It's hard to know exactly how many in, are in use at any time, but there are lots and lots of them, and more are being invented every day. And now, regularly, every few years, the Centers for Disease Control, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, does a survey. It's called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, N-H-A-N-E-S for short. And they are testing um, a wide cross-section of Americans for the presence of now over 200 industrial chemicals in blood and urine samples. And they're finding that the majority of Americans tested have great numbers of these chemicals in their system. And there have also been quite a number of studies done now testing newborns umbilical cord blood, and several of these studies have turned up over 200 synthetic industrial chemicals in newborns' blood. And that's, I think, a really strong signal of how extremely pervasive this exposure is, because those babies haven't been around very long and the idea that those chemicals have gone all the way through their mother's bodies and ended up in them at birth, I just find very, very striking. So on this list of sort of game-changing things that we've learned in the past 10 to 20 years, the sources, the number of chemicals, how they last, how they move around the world. And one of the really big things that we've learned is about timing of exposure, how the chemicals interact with living cells, and the kinds of subtle effects it can create. And I've mentioned before that early life turns out to be a really, really important time for setting the stage for health throughout life. And indeed, it seems to be pretty much a consensus in the world of environmental health science that early life exposure to environmental contaminants can indeed set the stage for any number of adult diseases. And the tricky thing about all of this is that not everybody who is exposed to a chemical will ever, ever show any signs of any illness that might be associated with this. And it may take years for any effects to show up. So it's always really tricky to prove cause and effect. 
which is one of the many challenges we have in trying to craft policy to address these things. And the other thing that complicates all this is that each of us has very distinct and individual chemistry. So how one person's body may respond to a chemical exposure very likely will not be identical to somebody else's. But one thing that is now widely accepted is that timing of exposure is really, really important. And again, that early life stage is considered one of the most vulnerable and susceptible. And in fact, in the past several years, a number of major professional medical associations have come out with policy statements. The American Medical Association, American Nurses Association, American Public Health Association, among others, have all made policy statements, and they're quite easy to find online, saying that to improve public health, one of the things we need to do is to reduce, if not eliminate, exposure to this type of environmental chemical that can particularly interact with children's, newborns, infants, hormones, particularly endocrine hormones. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I think that's really important to understand that this scientific sort of consensus is out there. Another thing that's happened recently in that realm is a few years ago, scientific societies that represent more than 40,000 scientists wrote a letter, an open letter, to the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, calling for more research into this kind of chemical exposure because they think it's so important to really understand. So I just mentioned hormones and endocrine hormones. How many here are, have heard of or are familiar with the concept of endocrine disruptors? Yeah, quite a lot of people. Well, that's another one of the really big game changers, because one of the things that people started sort of homing in on in the late 1980s um, throughout the 1990s, and it really got put on the map in the mid-1990s, is that a huge number of synthetic industrial chemicals have structures and shapes and chemical compositions that enable them to interfere with or disrupt or even mimic the workings of the endocrine hormones, which are absolutely essential for maintaining all sorts of healthy body systems. And we now understand that endocrine hormones are part of maintaining not only healthy metabolism that most people are familiar with and reproduction and development, but also important for cardiovascular health and some immune system functions and also for neurological and cognitive function. So because these chemicals can interfere with how an endocrine hormone works, it means they can upset the very delicate balance, and it's often described as a feedback loop, of what a hormone at a particular time that it's released in the body sets in motion. And it's also been discovered, and I think it was Dr. Clement who mentioned epigenetics, that these kind of chemicals can change the way genetic material works. And it can get a lot more technical than that. But I think the important thing to understand is that it doesn't make a mutation or a genetic defect. It changes the chemistry in the cell in a way so that the gene essentially doesn't behave the way it's supposed to in a healthy body. And the response of that genetic interaction is so profound that it actually can create a pattern that is passed on to subsequent generations. And there are now a lot of studies out there that are looking at multi-generational, transgenerational chemical exposures so that the individual who was exposed, she doesn't show any effects, but those show up in her children and her grandchildren. And that, I think, is really, really profound. So. We've introduced a changed understanding of a changed landscape of where chemicals are coming from, what kinds and the numbers we're surrounded by, and also the fact that timing of exposure is really, really important. And early life isn't the only vulnerable time. Puberty, other transitions in development are really important. And there's increasing research that well into later life, Old age always sounds so bad, but later life is also a really important stage so that 
you know, our bodies don't stop changing, they don't stop developing, the brain doesn't stop working, but, and chemicals can affect things at all sorts of stages of life, but those early stages when things are happening really fast within a developing body, that's a really key time. Another big game-changing understanding that has developed in the past, again, 10 to 15 years, is the idea of low doses. And I'm guessing that a lot of people here, how many people have heard about low dose effects? Yep, not as many as the endocrine disruptors, but it's related to it. So one of the things that has become increasingly part of all of this environmental health science research is looking at what happens at very, very low levels of exposure. And scientists are now repeatedly seeing effects, not just at the parts per billion level, but at the parts per trillion level. And that's just incredibly small. And it used the sort of traditional assumption in toxicology, the science of understanding toxic and poisonous things, was that the more of a hazardous substance someone was exposed to, the greater the effect would be. So a little bit of exposure, maybe not so bad, but as you increased it, the effects would get worse and worse. What's happened as people, have, scientists have started to understand these chemicals that can affect hormones particularly, is that they may produce their greatest adverse effect or the potential for the greatest later adverse effect with a very tiny, tiny exposure at a particularly sensitive stage of development. And for a lot of these substances, it turns out that if you are exposed to a lot of the same thing, either nothing may happen or a very different result may be produced. So if you read studies, you may read about nonlinear, non-monotonic dose responses, and it all sounds very complicated, and it actually is. But the idea to keep in mind is that with these kind of chemicals that can interfere with hormone responses, a very small amount can produce a profound effect, and the level of exposure is not direct, does not necessarily directly connected to the enormity of the result. And this presents a huge challenge for toxicology, and it presents a huge challenge for policy. Because historically, how chemicals regulations, chemicals regulatory policy has worked has been to figure out some level that was safe. You know, how much of this thing can I be exposed to before it's going to make me sick? And increasingly, we're discovering that smaller and smaller amounts may actually be really toxic. I'm sure a lot of you have been reading about the history of what we've learned about exposure to lead, which is actually a really simple compound. No, um, yeah, it's a simple substance, nowhere near as complex as any of these synthesized molecules. But the general acceptance now is that no level of lead exposure is safe. And so this idea that you can't set a limit that is safe completely upends how we've gone about regulating chemicals and saying what is safe. So we have to have a really different approach to figuring out how we keep these things out of our lives. Because again, you can't put a scrubber on a couch cushion that's loaded up with chlorinated or brominated flame retardants that people have found upset thyroid hormone function and are implicated in certain kinds of cancer. You just can't do it. You have to design a different kind of couch cushion. And if it turns out you need to have some kind of chemical that's going to make something flexible or waterproof, and I live in Oregon now, I'm originally from New York, but I live in Portland, Oregon, and it rains all the time, and I know my life would be a lot less happy if I didn't have a water repellent rain jacket. But right now, it's really, really hard to figure out how to make a water repellent molecule that is also going to be safe for the environment, but that's what the challenge is. How do we design new molecules and new products that are going to be safe for human health and the environment throughout their entire life cycle. And that's what the challenge of green chemistry is. And there are two leading green chemists, John Warner and Amy Cannon, who they actually have an organiza educational organization that's called Beyond Benign. And I think that's a really um, wonderful phrase. 
the sort of goal is to design mater new materials and new products that are beyond benign. And one of the other things that I wanted to make sure I got to um, after I've described all of these problems is the what to do part of it. Because this stuff can be really, really overwhelming. And I want to make sure we have time for questions. And I'm looking forward to seeing the very helpful young gentlemen who were the timekeepers so I know that I've got enough time to leave for questions. Um, so don't be shy to run up and tell me how much time I have left. Um, so we've got, we're surrounded by all of these chemicals and the real question is what, what do we do? How do we protect ourselves and our households and our families? What was that? That was a little odd. Um, yeah, sorry about that. That was a little disturbing. Um, anyway, while we're waiting for scientists to design safer new materials, and they are working on this, what started to happen is that people like you are going out there and doing the kind of reading that Stephen Shore did, and they're reading the scientific studies, and they're expressing their concern. And they're expressing this concern to companies that make products, companies that sell products, and they're also talking to their local elected officials. And regulations are slow and hard to change, they're imperfect, but they are starting to change, particularly at the state level. And there are lots of states, California, New York, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Washington, number of others that are really starting to try and dig in and figure out how, particularly for children's products, but also for a wider array of products, how can we start to, one, make sure that what is on our store shelves is actually safe and that we're doing this in a way that will make sure that if we take one hazardous material out of a product, it's not replaced by another one, which has happened time and time again. And there are lots and lots of examples from flame retardants to pesticides and lots of things in between. And how do we go about doing this a little bit more efficiently and effectively than we have before, not just regulating things one at a time? And so that's starting to happen. At the same time, the market, however imperfect, is starting to move well ahead of regulations. A number of enormous retailers have enormous faults, but I'll mention it because it's significant that it's even happened at all. Um, just a couple of months ago, Walmart and Target announced big new policies. They're not perfect. They're not complete. They're not 100 percent transparent. A lot of questions out there. But they, they've made commitments to big policies and are going to be working to get a whole bunch of well-known hazardous chemicals out of the products they sell. And I think it's a good sign if that part of mainstream commerce is sitting up and paying attention. So I think one of the most important things that you can do is read a lot, learn a lot. Um, two really good sources that I use all the time um, for health news um, so that you don't have to look at six million articles every single day. Um, there's something called environmental health news and they pull together all of the best reporting on environmental health and they put together headlines and little summaries and then they do their own extremely good interpretations of new science. It's freely available online. Another really good source that I like to use is what comes out of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. They have a publication called Environmental Health Perspectives. Again, it's free, available online. You could easily be overwhelmed because it's so comprehensive, but it's a great source of this information. So I would say read, learn things. I think we need to go beyond the teeny, teeny type on the labels because I even get confused. Those ingredients change all the time. And I think one of the things that's really important is to make sure we get to a point where those things are safe 
without having to read those ingredients. Everybody will always have personal preferences, but I like to think that the product will be safe for somebody who's in a real hurry with two little kids who are impatient to get home and doesn't have time to take out a magnifying glass, let alone have a smartphone to read something on a website. So read, ask questions, don't be shy. I'm guessing this audience is not shy about asking questions. Even if the questions seem really annoying and unpopular, Ask what's in those products that are coming into your workplace. Obviously, you're asking questions about what you're bringing home, but somebody's working on your house. You're putting in a new bathroom floor. Stop and ask, do you know what's in that thing? Read and find out as best you can what it is and see if there might be something safer. I just did that at my house. And you know, you'll learn a lot, and it really will make a difference. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you what will make you healthy or not, but it's really worth reading these questions, reading these, this information and asking these questions. And increasingly, there are organizations like the Healthy Building Network, the American Sustainable Business Coalition, lots and lots of NGOs out there that have been, they're largely people who've been asking these questions. Some are professional, some are not, but they've all come together and this is helping push these changes. So I am just going to wind up really quickly with just a few sentences from the end of my book, Chasing Molecules, and then I hope we've got a couple moments for questions. In economically difficult times, when thousands of jobs are being lost and covering basic living costs is difficult for many people, thinking about safer, greener materials, products that often carry a higher price tag can seem like a luxury. It's hard to think about parts per billion or million of a tasteless, odorless, invisible substance that may or may not be interacting with your equally invisible genes and hormones when you're worried about paying the rent and feeding your children. But we can't afford not to make these changes. The consequences are too great. We need to find ways to make such products the norm rather than the exception. So thank you, and I hope we've got a couple minutes for questions. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Max Tuck from the UK. Um, if there were one chemical, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, if there were one chemical that you would say should be avoided above all others, what would it be? Um, I have been asked that question, and I, I'm not dodging the answer, but I, I think about it in a different way. I think about it as what kind of chemical or where those chemicals are, and I would avoid some of the chemicals that I've just been talking about as they come into contact with food. Anything that's going to be end up in your food or anything that young children are going to be interacting with. If you have small children at home and they're going to be crawling around the floor and there's nothing you can, I mean, that's the way it should be. I'd avoid things that come into contact with food, plastics coming into contact with food. Don't put any plastics in hot anything. Don't put them in the microwave. Don't heat them up. One scientist I talked to spoke of the microwave as a molecule activator. So I think food contact, skin contact, children are the places where I'd look rather than the discrete list of chemicals and work at it that way. Um, you know, in order to prevent this or get rid of this, I wrote a book on juice fasting. And there's been studies that, you know, a seven-day juice fast is good house cleaning. cleaning. 14 to 21-day juice fast is going to go deeper, pull the adipose tissues out which have those, put them into the bloodstream, and they get flushed out. And uh, this has been found a lot in natural hygiene movement where they did a lot of fasting. I know Brian Clements does fasting at his uh, institute. Do you have any comment on juice or water fasting as a um, means of getting rid of this stuff? Yeah, I have to say I don't know anything about that end of the spectrum. What I do know is that there are an awful lot of studies that show if we take these chemicals out of the environment, they've been both controlled and natural system experiments where, say, the brominated flame retardants were taken out of use in Sweden. The levels in breast milk have plummeted. Um, and the main thing is make sure you start taking the contaminants out of the system while the system is still healthy and can recover, because that was sort of the other big point of those studies. If the system was still fully functioning, otherwise it was resilient and came back. But as to fasting and 
personal cleansing, I know nothing about it, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. So I have a question about the, um, we can do what we can to take the chemicals out of the products that we buy. We can buy organic foods and do all of, you know, protect ourselves in that way. But if we're rinsing any of those products in water, you know, food, for example, then aren't we just getting all of those chemicals we're trying hard to avoid? Because the standards of the water is so... Yeah, this stuff... You know, not controlled. Yeah, yeah. This can be really, really overwhelming. And I've asked this question of a lot of the scientists that I've talked to. You know, what do you tell your patients to those of them that are med also medical professionals? And by and large, the answer that I have gotten repeatedly is you do first what's going to make the biggest difference. Sort of like the first person question, um, things that are going to come into contact with food, if you're feeding children, find out if there's, you can get information about your water system. I get these things, they're very, very confusing. So at a certain point, you sort of have to make, a, you know, some kind of priority of choices because otherwise it's just completely overwhelming. But personal care products, food contact products, that's where I'd start. And, you know, do research your water, your water system. And I'm not an expert in water filters. Water quality changes continually. Um, but that issue of the contaminants that are not addressed by traditional wastewater treatment is a really big issue and increasingly um, utilities and state environmental agencies are trying to address it. So sort of get engaged with that process, but I, I, can't, I don't know the absolute answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hello. I have a question uh, concerning the names of any congressmen, senators or congressmen that you know of that can be counted on to take these issues seriously. And also, as a corollary, do you know anyone, or um, is there anyone that's standing up in the Consumer Protection Agency that Elizabeth Warren created that also is uh, some people that we can be looking toward to yeah. be on our side? Yeah. Um, when it comes to consumer protection, the agency that Elizabeth Warren helped start is for finances. The agency that works on consumer products is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And they do safety as well as some of the chemical effects. Um, there's something called the Chemical Safety Improvement Act, which has kind of got a very specific suite of things it looks at. But that's the agency that works on that. Also, uh, the Food and Drug Administration and EPA um, have bits and pieces of that. When it comes to the federal elected officials, congressmen and senators in the Senate, um, look to the list of, I hate to be partisan, but right now, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, the Democrats on the Environment and Public Works Commission include some really good champions of these environmental health issues. Um, there are a couple of Republicans that kind of move over to that side as well, um, but some of that changes, so I'm not quite up on exactly who th those are. But the Environment and Public Works Commission is where you're going to find a lot of those champions. Uh, there's also some slightly more obscure commission, uh, committees that work on health and in education and labor. But it's called EPW for short. And um, I can talk to you later about the House. It's a little more complicated. But the Senate is where some really big champions are. And also, don't overlook the local level, because that's where, that's where all the action is right now. Because of the nature of Congress, the, it's just like total gridlock. Um, but look to see what's happening locally. And one last question, and then we're done. Okay. Can you identify any general tests that one can take or an in, individual could take to, I guess, identify exposure to toxins? Because a lot of people will say, well, hey, I have mercury toxin exposure. I have this illness or that illness, and it's caused by a particular toxin. But there's really no clear-cut way to say, hey, I'm being affected by and some contaminant. I am going to defer to the health professionals who may be here because that's not um, an area of my expertise. And, but I do know that that's something that's increasingly um, being researched to figure out how you can do more general tests. You can have blood or other body 
fluid tested for chemicals, but as to linking it to a specific disease, it's very tricky, and I'm happy to talk more about what I've learned um, afterwards. But I think we're out of time, so thank you all very much for being here and listening.